Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, March 18th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Over the last couple of weeks, I took a closer look at some reflective DNS denial of service attacks. And well, while these attacks are not anything new, they are certainly not going away. And I just want to get a feel for where these attacks are at uh, currently. Now, one thing that keeps popping up uh, with these attacks is that the DNS records being used to amplify these attacks are quite often dark. Gov domains. Actually, in the sample here, and uh, admittedly, this is a little bit of a random sample. Uh, it uh, may be somewhat biased, but the number one domain by far being used here is access-dashboard.gov. We had before, for example, peacecorp.gov being used in this manner. And part of the reason for this is not just that .gov domains, of course, are typically sort of considered trusted and not usually blocked. The real problem here is that all .gov domains typically use DNSSEC and DNSSEC actually works in the favor of these denial of service attacks. It does actually make them somewhat worse because like in this case, this domain really only has one A record uh, that's being returned here, but uh, they're also returning all of these DNSSEC records, all of the keys and the signatures, and, and that increases the size of the response here to about two kilobytes. Second uh, domain, or second, I should say, a record uh, that uh, was being requested as part of these denial of service attacks was also the name servers for the root zone. Now, uh, this priming response, as it's sometimes called, is often enabled on Windows name servers. So uh, that's uh, why this is kind of a popular query. Not by as bad as uh, some of these .gov uh, records, but still you get uh, 823 bytes in this response. Now the targets, uh, IRC servers, you know, again, sort of uh, something that's not really going away. They have always been sort of at the top of the list of sort of these nuisance, I would say, denial of service attacks. And of course, you know, lots of small business, shared servers, basically people that don't really have the money to pay for proper anti-denial of service services. Uh, I didn't see sort of any name brand large targets here. And I believe that you know, they basically can pay for the respective service. And since uh, these reflective DNS DDoS attacks are sort of a very known quantity, most of the anti-denial of service services have them well under control. And Brad posted a quick update on what's going on with TrickBot these days. Apparently, TrickBot sort of learned, well, a new trick in distributing itself as a DLL file instead of an executable. TrickBot is often used as an info stealer, also banking malware, but then later also rent it out in order to install additional malware. So essentially, the attacker here is first trying to get all the secrets they sort of care about out of the machine. Once they're sort of done with the machine, they resell it to some ransomware gangs or the like for additional profit. And remember about a year ago in March of 2019, CoinHive, a site that made it rather easy to mine crypto coins with JavaScript, well, shut down. And this, of course, was sort of seen as a little bit of a sign of hope that crypto jacking in websites would decline. We now have a research paper by some researchers at the University of Cincinnati and Lakehead University to actually look a little bit closer into what happened to crypto jacking since then. And they're specifically here looking at the browser and website JavaScript based crypto jacking. So not at the crypto jacking that sort of happens uh, with scripts uh, running on the server itself. Now, they started with a method that uh, I think uh, may not be the best way to approach this. They looked at 2,770 websites that were detected of running uh crypto jacking uh, JavaScript back in March of 2019 and basically checked 
at how many of them are still running the code. The reason I don't quite like this approach is that first of all, well, uh, hopefully some of these sites just got cleaned up uh, because uh, people realized they got compromised. And then for the ones that didn't get uh, cleaned up, uh, well, that's not really what I'm interested in. The interesting ones would be the ones that actually moved to different code and that is now using different systems uh, other than uh, CoinHive to uh, mine uh, uh, coin, uh, to mine crypto coins and they did a little bit of that uh, they uh, actually sort of uh, found eight unique mining scripts uh, looking at the remaining one percent of websites that were still infected and then looking for these uh, mining scripts they actually found 632 unique crypto jacking websites that ran this newer code and I think that's really sort of the number to compare somewhat so a year ago we had 2000 770 websites this year uh, we have 632 websites so certainly a marked decline uh, but uh, probably too early to call crypto jacking debt and remember how we didn't get any adobe acrobat patches with patch tuesday well Adobe came out with some for us now. Total of uh, 12, if I counted correctly, vulnerabilities being addressed. Nine of them are considered critical. The problem, of course, with in particular Adobe Acrobat patches being released outside of Patch Tuesday is that this will require sort of additional browser updates because part of this code is also embedded in some browsers that are often patched on Patch Tuesday. Both Windows and Mac OS are affected by these vulnerabilities. Linux is not listed as a vulnerable system, even though I believe that some of this code also runs on Linux. Well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening. Uh, tonight on a Wednesday evening, I will actually be giving a talk online as part of our ongoing SANS Cybercast. We call uh, these talks sort of now SANS at MIC instead of SANS at night. Uh, we'll be at uh, 8.30 p.m. Eastern. So I'll post the links on Twitter and such if you're interested. It will be about sort of some of the recent changes in TLS and how to deal with them. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.